They are considered the deadliest animal in the world. They're also one of the smallest. We're talking about mosquitoes and the bloodborne diseases that they carry, including malaria. So for this case at Q&A, we are joined by Dr. Ian Cheeseman, the associate professor at Texas Biomedical Research. Doctor, appreciate your time. Uh, obviously, it's big news when we see malaria in Texas, also seen in Florida. Are you surprised that we're seeing it? Why or why not? This is not an enormous shock for us. It's It's been a very long time since we've seen um, an, uh, a locally acquired case of malaria in Texas, um, I believe around 30 years. But the conditions for, for malaria have been long existing in San Antonio. We used to have local transmission up until kind of the 1960s or so when malaria was eliminated here. Um, and we still have the mosquitoes that can carry and transmit malaria here throughout South Texas, the Anopheline mosquitoes. Um, and we have the conditions here which are quite conducive for spread, especially in the last um, few weeks where we've seen a very, very wet period, followed by a very, very hot period, which is fantastic for both uh, mosquitoes to uh, grow and for diseases to, to develop within mosquitoes. Yeah, mosquitoes are alive and well in my own backyard. I know that very much. But put this into perspective for us. So is there a real reason for concern when we hear about this case in, in, out of Cameron County from somebody who has not traveled outside of the U.S.? I think the message is certainly do not panic. So be aware, take the same precautions that you would be to, to prevent getting bitten by mosquitoes normally. Make sure that you're wearing kind of appropriate clothing covering up as much as you can. Um, if you can stay inside during kind of dawn and dusk when mosquitoes are kind of most active, uh, wearing bug spray and, and all the things that we would normally kind of do to prevent uh, being bitten of the precautions that you would want to take anyway. The risk is exceptionally low. Um, in the last kind of 10 days or so, there's not been any uh, suggestion of a second case of malaria that is locally acquired in Cameron County or anywhere else in Texas. So, so I know at this point, the risk is quite low. Okay, great. So I, I know that you are a malaria expert. I mean, that's what you research. It's what you look at. It's what you study on a daily basis. Are there vaccines for malaria and are they effective? So there is one licensed vaccine that's out there. It's called RTSS. Um, it is not particularly effective. Um, where sort of vaccination for COVID um, reaches kind of 80, 90% um, efficacy. Uh, the vaccines against malaria in highly um, endemic countries where you're getting bitten by malarious mosquitoes potentially every day, um, the vaccine efficacy is much, much lower, um, potentially as low as kind of 20 to 40%. Um, and um, lasts not a particularly long time either. But there is hope for kind of future vaccines. Uh, we do have an arsenal of drugs to treat malaria. Uh, one of the major threats we are seeing right now is the emergence and spread of drug resistance, particularly to a drug called artemisinin. Um, now, having said that, the case that we saw in Texas was uh, one malaria parasite species called Plasmodium vivax which um, does not have uh, widespread drug resistance to artemisinin. So it's likely that treatment um, of um, symptoms would be very effective there. Uh, it is also a slightly unusual parasite. Um, it's unusual even within malaria parasites in that once the parasite invades the bloodstream, so uh, um, from a um, the bite of malarious mosquito, it will travel to the liver where, where it will develop. And some parasites will burst out into the bloodstream and cause the symptoms that we know mm. of malaria. Fever, it headache, high temperature, um, kind of non-specific flu-like illnesses, typically. Yeah, that um, can be symptoms for a lot of different things. So I'm sure it's hard to really kind of tell if that's the issue. And I, I know, too, that you have talked about how climate change and weather patterns have a role here in increasing cases of malaria. How so? So certainly we have, you know, as I 
mentioned earlier, the, the existing conditions here for malaria in San Antonio, and as we get kind of hotter and hotter periods, um, the, the disease can, can spread more effectively within mosquitoes, which means that transmission from one person to a mosquito uh, and from that mosquito to another person happens much more effectively. Um, so um, as we see kind of hotter periods, hotter and wetter periods start to become more normal, we will certainly see the, the potential for more spread of not just malaria, but other kind of vector-borne diseases, malaria, uh, sorry, mosquito-borne diseases, such um, such as West Nile and others. Yeah, chikungunya. Uh, so uh, I know you're in San Antonio. Texas Biomedical is in San Antonio. This is not unusual for San Antonio in its history. I mean, there's been massive malaria outbreaks in the city, like dating back to the 1930s, correct? Absolutely. So, so here used to be a little bit of a hot spot for invention of, of, of kind of malaria control methods. So back in the kind of early part of the last century, um, there was a there was a researcher called Chaz Chandler who um, pioneered using bats to control malaria, which is a very novel approach. And essentially, bats are natural predators of mosquitoes. They will go out and eat them. And he erected bat houses throughout the city and throughout a lot of South Texas uh, around kind of swampy areas where mosquitoes like to live and the mosquitoes would go out and eat, uh, sorry, the bats would go out and eat the mosquitoes and the theory was that that drive, drove down disease. Now it was also coupled with a lot of other technological improvements like the uh, uh, spread of air conditioning uh, and draining of swamps and those kind of things which were also really great ways of breaking transmission cycles for, for mosquito-borne diseases. But his efforts were, were sort of recognized by the Texas state, and he was nominated by the state of Texas for winning the Nobel Prize back in the 1930s. And yeah. I know that we, we all know improving drainage and you know emptying standing water, all those things in our own backyards are ways that we can help too if you don't have a bat house yeah. per se. But you know, the advent <laughs> of, of drainage and that kind of stuff isn't as cool as bats. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Ian Cheeseman. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Ian Cheeseman, Associate Professor at Texas Biomedical Research. I appreciate your time and your insight on this subject. Thank you so much for inviting me. Keep up to date with all of San Antonio's top news, weather, and so much more by clicking the like and subscribe buttons below. And once again, thanks for watching KSAT.